Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Catherine. I'm the Assistant Director of Research and Training at the Women's Center of Tarrant County. Uh, just so you know a little bit about what we're going to be doing today and who is speaking to you, I just want to let you know about our services at the Women's Center. Um, the Women's Center is the Rape Crisis Center for Tarrant County, which means that we provide um, free services for men, women, and children who have been victims of sexual assault and abuse or any other kind of violent crime. We have trauma-informed counseling, case management, we have a lawyer on staff for legal services for survivors, and then we also provide crisis accompaniment and we have a crisis hotline for people who have been victimized recently to respond to the hospital as well as to the court. If you have any questions about our resources, my information will be at the end of the slide. Feel free to take that, um, or also you can go to our website, which is womenscentertc, as in tarrantcounty.org. And let's get started. Okay, today we're going to be talking about the dynamics of sexual assault. Hopefully, you'll be able to separate some myths and misconceptions from facts about sexual assault and other forms of sexual violence. We'll peer into the mind just a little bit of offenders to understand their motivations, explore the effects of sexual violence and trauma on survivor, and then discover how can you respond to survivors in a trauma-informed manner. Now, we only have about an hour to an hour and a half today to talk about all of this information. So this will really be a general overview of sexual assault and sexual violence and just a little bit of how to start looking at this from a trauma-informed lens. Okay, let's get started. Before we get started, we have to know what we're talking about. So we're gonna just go over some basic definitions. What is sexual assault and what is sexual violence? These are terms that are used very, very broadly, but actually in the state of Texas, sexual assault is rape. It is oral, anal, or vaginal penetration with a body part or an object. It is sex without consent or when consent has been withdrawn. Just recently, in 2017, coercion was added to this law, meaning that um, if, if consent is gathered through coercion, it can be considered sexual assault as well. Um, so again, in Texas, the actual definition of sexual assault is rape. A lot of times you'll hear people talk about sexual assault as an umbrella term for all kinds of sexual violence. Um, today we will be using the term sexual assault to define rape and when talking about sexual abuse in general we'll be talking the, about sexual violence. So what is consent? You know since the definition has consent in it, you know it's sex with, sexual assault, sex without consent, consent has been withdrawn, or consent received through coercion, we have to define what that is. Um, consent is not the absence of a no. I think a lot of us grew up, well at least I did, grew up going to college uh, where there were a whole bunch of campaigns saying no means no. Well, that's really not true. What we need with consent is we need an affirmative yes. And we need consent to be given free of that coercion. Um, we're going to watch a video to see what this means for just an overview. Of consent, it is a little bit funny video. I know most people have probably seen it, but I really think that it helps to provide a general overview of what we're looking at when we're talking about this. Um, again, remember consent is the dividing line between a healthy sexual relationship or experience and sexual assault. So with that, we're gonna watch the video. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, 
Now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. Okay, I hope y'all all enjoyed that video. Like I said, I'm sure that you've probably seen it. A lot of colleges are showing it during freshman orientation now. But I really like to use it because it really helps to break down consent in very basic terms. Um, again, remember, sexual assault is um, whenever there is an act of sex, oral, anal, vaginal penetration, uh, where there is no consent at all, when consent has been withdrawn, or when consent is given through coercion. Um, I do just want to stress before we go into statistics that the coercion piece is extremely important and although it was just recently added in 2017 so hasn't really had a chance to be tested in the courts, it's extremely important for survivors because what we know about sexual assault is that it is a type of trauma and when people respond to traumas they can respond in one of three ways. They can fight it off, they can flee, or they can freeze. And literally what I mean by fighting is fighting it off. So when you think about um, animals, if you think about at uh, the Fort Worth Zoo, if the lion and a bear were to get out of their cages and they meet at the monkey area, are they gonna run from each other? No, they are gonna fight. They are facing a trauma or a potential trauma and they're gonna fight it out. You know, you have the king of the jungle and the king of the forest. They're not going to run. When we're talking about fleeing, we're really meaning someone who responds to trauma by trying to get away, trying to find a place to hide. So if you think again about animals that do this, think about giraffes. You know, if that lion is chasing a, that giraffe in that zoo, that giraffe's going to run away. Or that gazelle that is bouncing across the plains, that is fleeing. And then the last one that really comes into play when we're talking about the coercion piece of sexual assault is the freezing. What happens a lot with sexual assault survivors when they're faced with this trauma is they freeze up. And that can actually look like freezing. It can look like not being able to speak. It can look like somebody who dissociates and is no longer focused on what is right in front of them. It can look like many things. But when you look in the animal kingdom, we have to remember freezing keeps people alive and keeps animals alive. So you think of animals like possums or rabbits when they have a spotlight on them. Um, I just recently learned that mice, sometimes when they are faced with some predators, will freeze. All of these animals, turtles going into their shell, all of these animals freeze. And if freezing didn't work, they would be extinct. So when we're looking at consent, we have to remember that there needs to be that affirmative consent without coercion. Just because someone says yes, or just because someone doesn't say anything, doesn't necessarily mean they're wanting it. It is so important to check in and then check in again to make sure that they weren't just responding out of fear. So with that, let's look at how often does this happen? 
We're going to look at some stats about sexual violence in general, as well as sexual assault specifically. In Texas, two in five women and one in five men report being a survivor of sexual assault at some point in their lifetime. That could be as a child or as an adult. Now this is astonishing. This is an enormous amount of people who report being victimized in this way. This report came out in 2015. The original came out in 2003. And at that time, it was reported that one in five women and one in 20 men were victims of sexual assault. What is happening? Is this increasing? Well, no, it's not. Actually, the rates of sexual assault are staying pretty steady. Some, in some places across the nation, they are starting to dip. What we have noticed, though, and what the report came out saying is that the stigma of sexual assault survivors and the ability to speak up is really changing. People are starting to feel less shame about speaking up about this. They are feeling more of a connection in being able to identify as a survivor of sexual assault. And so because of this, we are starting to know the reality of what these numbers really are. Now, the next stat on there says 65.2% of victims report multiple victimizations. Why is this important? This is important because, like I said, sexual assault is a type of trauma. Whenever somebody experiences a trauma, they not only experience it in that moment, okay? It's not just an emotional experience. It actually changes some of our chemistry in our brain. It changes some of the lineup of our neuropath, this is the brain, by the way, it changes some of the pathways of our neuropathways. Um, it changes the type of chemicals that are released in our brain that help us survive. And it keeps us in survival mode. It keeps our body in this high stress state, okay? It keeps our body flowing and functioning as though we are constantly sur surviving a trauma. If people experience multiple traumas, they are at a higher risk of having multiple, multiple medical effects and physical effects later on in life because of the victimizations. So when we are looking at people in Texas who report being a survivor of sexual assault, we are looking at people who not only experience one trauma, we're looking at people who experience complex trauma. Okay, that's so important because that means when they come to you, they are not just dealing with the one thing that happened. They're also dealing with the things that happened before and maybe before that and maybe that are still ongoing. In Texas, ages 12 to 34 are at the highest risk of sexual assault. And with all of these age ranges, even younger than 12 and older than 34, 8 out of 10 times people know the perpetrator. Offenders are not just strangers in the bushes. That is one of the myths we're going to talk about later, and that's one of the myths that people continue to believe. You know, I know that uh, when I was little, we had a whole bunch of risk reduction programs about stranger danger, you know, don't go into the car with the, the white van with the man who wants you to help get their puppy or get the candy. That's just not the case. Of course that happens, but the reality is when we look at sexual violence in Texas, 80% of the time, and this includes children and adults, people know the offender, which makes it so much harder to speak out, makes it so much harder to report, and it makes it so much more confusing for victims. Because if I know my offender, then I also know some of the good things that they've done before. I now see them in this dichotomy of, well, they, I know them all these good things they've done, but they did this awful thing to me. So who are they really? And, and it really makes people start questioning what has happened to them. So let's look at offenders and let's see how does this happen. When we're looking at offenders, it's so important to know sex offenders are both men and women. They're male and female. Okay? It's not just men going out sexually assaulting people. Okay? And it's also important to know that the majority of the time, it is a small group of people doing this over and over and over again. Most offenders of children have over 50 victims before they're ever caught the first time. That's astonishing. Astonishing. Uh, having 50 victims before you're ever caught the first time. When we look at adult sexual assaults, really it's about um, 
an offender offends about three times before somebody finally reports on them. Now that doesn't mean that they are going to be convicted and go to jail after that. No, actually, when we look at stats for jail, out of every thousand rapes, 344 are reported to the police, which is very low. But out of that 344, only 63 reports even lead to an arrest. 13 cases get referred to prosecutors, 7 cases lead to a felony conviction, and only 6 will be incarcerated. That means that the offenders are going out continuing to sexually assault people and sexually victimize people over and over and over again. When we look at sex offenders by gender, and we break it down by male victims and female victims, male victims in Texas report that 54% of the time their offender was a man, and almost 53% of the time the uh, offender was a woman. Now, I know this does not add up to 100%. That's because a lot of these men reported multiple victimizations. You have to go back to the 63% of Texans report multiple victimizations. So some of the men in this study could have had a male offender and a female offender or had multiple male offenders or female offenders. But that's astonishing to me because a lot of times we think that only men perpetrate on other men. That's a myth that is in our society. But the reality is male victims, like I said, half the time report that their offender was a woman. Now when we look at female victims in Texas, the majority of the time women are reporting that the offender was a man. So about 94% of the time women in Texas report the person who sexually assaulted them was a man and about 9% of the time it was a woman. And again, I know this adds up to more than 100%. Remembering again, for the third time, people are experiencing complex trauma, they're experiencing multiple victimizations. So what do the offenders look like? There are some common personality traits among sex offenders. Um, we do see a lot of sexual preoccupation, which means that people are constantly thinking about sex. What this looks like is, if, um, if you're telling a joke, somebody always forms it into a sexual joke. If you make a comment, somebody always turns it into a comment. Now, I love The Office, but it would be something like, that's what she said all the time, over and over and over again. Okay. Uh, another per common personality trait among sex offenders is there's a lot of defensiveness that they have. Um, it's a defensiveness of, um, you can't tell me what to do or I didn't do that. They're already planning what they're going to say to really justify what they have done or the way that they are thinking. Um, we do see some sex offenders typically more with, well, all age ranges, having some poor self-image. And this is important because when we look at sexual assault, you know, we gave the definition earlier on as rape, remember, oral, anal, vaginal penetration where consent has been withdrawn, consent is received through coercion, or there is no consent. Um, but poor self-image is important because sexual assault, the reality of it, is it is a crime about power and control. And it's about one person trying to obtain power over another person through sex, okay? This is a crime. This is a crime where one person, maybe with that poor self-image, tries to regain power or feel powerful by using sex as a weapon to control another person. That's where we see the poor self-image come in. You also see some of that with narcissism, and that really helps back up some of that power and control dynamic as well. Because if I believe that everything is about me, and um, the world revolves for me, or I only see the lens through my eyes, then I cannot see how this is affecting potential victims. All that I really see is I need this power, I need to feel in control, and I can prey on this vulnerable person. Okay? When we look at ruminative traits, what that means is that somebody's constantly thinking about the acts that they've done. This really comes into play when we're looking at child abusers, people who abuse children. They're constantly thinking about that um, one sexual act that they did and remembering it in very fond ways in order to then get aroused to maybe go do something later on. Okay, And then again, we see some social alienation. Social alienation really could go either way. While it is common for people who sexually offend others to have this, 
Um, you also see people who have a lot of friends, but, are, but they tend not to be close relationships. So they might social alienate by not having any, but the reality is they're going to have a lot of friends, they're going to have a lot of connections, but no real serious, deep, meaningful relationships. Okay, so what motivates people to offend? Well, in order to offend, people need three things, okay? They need access to another person. They need to have some form of deviant sexual arousal. And then they also have some faulty thinking. We're going to break down each of these just a little bit more. When we look at faulty thinking, it's important to know we all have a little bit of faulty thinking. Faulty thinking is things like, you know, I went for a two mile run this morning, so that means for lunch I can go get McDonald's. You know, balancing out and justifying our own behavior um, to try and rationalize what we're planning to do. Okay. Some ways that offenders have that faulty thinking and justify their behavior are saying things like, somebody was wearing a tight outfit, they were just asking for it, or, well, she was flirting with me, so therefore she was leading me on, and that was really saying she wanted to have sex with me. When we look at people who abuse children, a common way that, or common thing that we hear over and over again about rationalization is, um, I was just teaching them about how to have sex. Somebody has to teach them. Schools these days don't do it. Uh, we also hear about people saying things like, well, kings and cavemen did it. You know, this is just in my DNA, especially if it's a man. We will hear a lot about men are supposed to be like this. This is our biology. When it comes to consent, a very common one we hear is, well, that person never said to stop and never actually said no. Well, remember what I said earlier? That might be the case. Somebody might not have said anything. But one, it, they, could have been, they could have been experiencing that trauma and had a freeze response. Or two, maybe they're under age. Maybe they are a teenager and this is an adult. Well, they don't have to say no. That is automatically against the law. Okay. And then there's an idea in our society that um, whenever women, typically women meet, say no, that they really mean yes. And so what we hear from offenders is, well, they said no, but all the body language was really saying yes. Well, if somebody says no, they really mean no. And then one of the, two of the last two are, um, you can't rape your spouse. That is still really common because what we are fighting a fairly new law. Actually, it wasn't um, illegal in Texas until 1993. To There was no statute about sexual assaulting your spouse. There, that just was not considered a criminal offense until 1993 in Texas. So we still have multiple generations that grew up with that belief that you can't rape your spouse. So we really are fighting that. And then there's no actual intercourse. So that would be somebody saying, well, it wasn't actually sexual assault. There was just some fondling or just some groping. Well, that can still be a traumatic experience for somebody. Um, it's really crossing their boundaries. It was something that was against their consent. If it's a child, um, it can absolutely be traumatic and ongoing for the rest of their lives. Um, so it doesn't have to be actual intercourse for there to have been an offense. Okay. We're going to watch a video now about a man who was convicted of sexual assault of a child. And what I hope that you can hear from this is some of the faulty thinking that he has and the ways that he justifies his behavior. Just because it's not the stranger in the alley doesn't mean it's not a crime. Um, in fact, I think it can be more damaging when it's someone that you trust. I can remember getting into a van. Um, there were um, mostly girls, a couple of guys, and then this guy that I knew in the van, and they were going to take me um, back to my apartment. Um, after that, my memory is really spotty. I can't remember very much. Um, I really my next memory after being in the van is being in my apartment in my bed and I woke up and there was um, somebody on top of me. My response was I was just in shock. I didn't know what happened. I didn't have a memory of what had happened. 
Um, and I just was totally confused. When I've always thought about rape in the past, I think about stranger rape. I think about aggressive, violent rape by somebody that you don't know. Um, and this was very different because this was somebody I knew and it wasn't a totally close friend, but it was somebody I trusted. And it was somebody that I had trusted enough to spend time with. I mean, this has been 13 years now and I don't think about it all the time. I don't think about it every day, but it does still come up in my life very regularly. It's just very unfair that, you know, a short-term decision on the part of the offender can have such a long-term impact on the victim. 10 years ago when I was 18, me and some friends had been drinking. Uh, we went back to, uh, back to his place uh, afterwards and kept drinking. Uh, there was an underage girl there. We encouraged her to drink. She began drinking. Uh, eventually, as the night went on, people went to bed and she laid down beside me. Uh, this uh, led to some inappropriate touching and, and I was really just thoughtless at the time. I attempted intercourse, but I could tell it uh, really made her kind of uncomfortable. And so I stopped and I eventually left the room. She never said no. I never forced her, but it's still classified as rape. I have to comply to the terms of the sex offender registry. This means I have to go four times a year. I have to give them all my information, my uh, address, where I'm employed, what car I drive. It makes it a lot harder for a person like myself to move on with their life and put their past behind them. But I didn't quite grasp the magnitude of what I had done. Um, I did not grasp that it would cost me 10 plus years of my life. I'll be, I'll be paying for this the rest of my life. Um, nor did I grasp the magnitude of the consequence that, or the burden that uh, my victim would have to bear uh, and her family would have to bear throughout all this and she will undoubtedly uh, continue to bear, uh, to continue to bear that burden. I can't even conceive of my son being classified as a sex offender. I tend to think, like most of the public does, that that is uh, the creepy people that want to attack our small children. Um, because there are restrictions on where he can live, we all kind of agreed the best thing was for him to live here at home um, with us. But if he lived with us, we could never have our grandchildren visit us. They could never come into our home because, hey, you have a sex offender in your home. So we've had to uh, cordon off part of our home, divide it off, and make kind of a little duplex, a you know, little apartment for him. And so he has his own separate residence, but it's still, I think, awkward for him to have to kind of be living this close to mom and dad at his age. I think he'd like to be more independent and so forth. And, and, and that decision isn't because of our family, because there's a sex offender living here. Uh, it's because of the law and the way that the law is interpreted and the enforcement of that law, which is very vigilant. Had I known the price then, I would have never done it. There are other people like me out there right now, people who could make the same mistakes I have, and I think this video uh, will hopefully uh, prevent them from taking the same path I've taken. you didn't see because I didn't show you the whole video is that he was about 20 years old when he committed this crime and in the full version he talks about how his victim was almost 13. What does that mean? That means his victim was 12. But one of the ways that he's justifying his behavior is by not claiming to know that the victim was that young by um, saying that the victim wanted it. Well what we know in Texas is that there is no way, nowhere in the law is it ever okay for someone who is 12 to consent to any kind of sexual activity that is against the law across the board. Um, but he is trying to justify it and just by adding that one year in our minds by saying, you know, almost 13, in his mind he's starting to make it okay. 
what are some other ways that he's justifying his behavior? Well, we hear him talk about, well, we were providing alcohol. So trying to justify what he did using his drinking. Well, let me tell you, alcohol does not cause sexual assault, okay? Really what it sounds like what he was doing is providing alcohol to some underage girls to make them in, put them in a more vulnerable position so that he could then prey on them. What's something else he does to justify his behavior? Well, he talks about how, well, it wasn't, I didn't think that it was rape. Well, m what I did wasn't that bad, um, but somehow it was considered rape. Well, again, going back to the definition of rape in Texas, oral, anal, or vaginal penetration with a body part or an object, it clearly was sexual assault. But he's trying, again, to downplay his behavior and downplay what he did in order to make it come across like it wasn't that big of a crime. And that is something very common to what offenders will do. So that was number one of our triangle. Let's look at the second piece, which is deviant sexual arousal. Deviant sexual arousal is characterized by specialized sexual fantasies, masturbatory practices, sexual props and requirements of the sexual partner. It is arousal to abnormal stimuli. Now, what that means is that people tend to have paraphilias. Just because someone has a paraphilia does not make them a sexual offender. But what we know is that a lot of sexual offenders do tend to have some paraphilias. So some of these are on the side. They're kind of hard to see. So let me just read them across to you. Um, exhibitionism is flashing. It's a flasher. Fetishism is objects. Uh, so somebody who is sexually aroused by objects. Frauderism is rubbing against somebody. Sexual, someone who gets sexual gratification from Typically, you see it in subways and tightly enclosed spaces. Somebody will just rub their genitals up on somebody who is unwilling. Um, masochism is somebody who is sexually aroused by receiving pain. Sadism is inflicting pain. Voyeurism is uh, peeping toms. Somebody who is sexually aroused by watching somebody um, in the stages of undress or taking a shower, taking a bath, or sleeping. Um, erotic asphyxiation, autoerotic asphyxiation is self-strangulation. Zoophilia is someone who is sexually aroused by animals. Gerophilia is someone who is sexually aroused by the elderly. Chlismophilia is someone um, who is sexually aroused by receiving enemas. Necrophilia with corpses. Pyrophilia by starting fires. Scatologia is not what you probably think it is. It is someone who is sexually aroused by obs receiving obscene or ta making obscene telephone calls. We actually receive a lot of these at the Women's Center. Um, you know, you'll pick up the phone and somebody, you can tell that somebody is getting sexually aroused by just talking to somebody or they're trying to make it an obscene phone call. Um, Urologia, sorry I'm mispronouncing some of these, is sexual arousal from urinating on somebody. And copophilia is by um, having feces either on them or on somebody else. Olfactophilia is someone who's sexually aroused by certain odors. Um, Pygmalionism is someone who's sexually aroused by statues and mannequins. Pedophilia is prepubescent children, and hemophilia is pubescent children, so teenagers. And then bastophilia is someone who is sexually aroused by sexually assaulting other people. When we look at these deviant sexual arousals, some of them are non-consensual. And so those are the ones that really are the falling under the sexual victimization category. Um, those would be uh, ex exhibitionism, so flashing. Frauderism, rubbing against somebody. Um, also, uh, hebophilia, uh, pedophilia, and, and rape, sexual assault. All of these are things that require a non-consensual person. And then I would actually throw in zoophilia as well. They, um, and, and vo voyeurism, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Um, they require a non-consensual partner to be there for that person to receive sexual gratification from that. In general, perpetrators look for vulnerable, vulnerable victims. So this is that access piece of our triangle. Perpetrators are not always looking for a challenge. A lot of times they're looking for people who seem vulnerable. And that can be many, many people. That could be any of us at any time of the day. You know, but in general, we have some vulnerable victims that we like to cover. So immigrants, how, how are they a vulnerable population? 
well, one, someone who is a documented immigrant, they might not know our customs, might not know the laws, might not know resources. So they are automatically going to be in a more vulnerable stance for somebody to perpetrate on them. Somebody who is undocumented is going to be even higher of a, as a vulnerable victim, an even higher vulnerable victim. Because what we tend to see is that Either the victim will believe that they can't report or they will be deported, or the offender will tell the victim, if you report, you will be deported. When the reality is, as the law stands today, if you are a victim of a crime such as sexual assault and you're cooperating the police, even if you're undocumented, that will not jeopardize your, um, your status in the country. When we look at the LGBTQ community, this is a vulnerable population because they have systemically um, not had laws to support them. They have systemically been put down in other ways. And if somebody is perpetrated against, let's say, by another man or by their partner, if they report and they are not out to other people, one, they might be having to out themselves against their terms or when they weren't ready, or two, they might fear outing themselves to a law enforcement officer who historically has um, uh, somehow, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, just systemically not handled people from this population in a safe, kind, and respectful way. When we look at prostitutes and sex workers, these are naturally vulnerable victims because what can an offender say? Offenders can say, well, uh, I paid her, or they're a sex worker, but the reality is just because maybe you are a sex worker and you choose to have sex with this client does not mean you're choosing to have sex with this client. They still get a choice as well. When we look at addicts, homelessness, people who are physically disabled, developmentally disabled, or people who are mentally ill and without their medication, all of these are people who are needing access and needing help from somebody else or resources in their life. And if they aren't getting them, then they are in a more vulnerable place. And somebody who is an offender can take advantage of this very easily. Victims of domestic violence, especially from their current partners. Um, and then other people who are involved in high-risk behaviors. I'm sure you can think of other vulnerable victims. This is just a list that we always like to show to just really remind you that there's so many people out there who are just vulnerable to having this happen to them. And now, you might fit this category or know someone who fits this category or not. And it, because this list is so long and could keep going forever, we all do need to know that we all are at risk for being sexually assaulted or knowing somebody who is sexually assaulted, especially, if, again, if we look at those stats. So if this many people are really sexually assaulted, why are people not reporting? We get that question all the time at the Women's Center. Well. Number one, there are so many myths in society that hold us back from reporting. Here are some myths that I know I grew up with thinking and believing, and I'm sure you might have heard some of them as well. So location and time, that's really easy. That's the, you shouldn't have been there, I told you not to go running in that park at that time, or never to go to that park. What about the behavior? Um, well, that goes back to remember the offender saying, well, they were flirting, they must have wanted it, or they've had sex before. Right? Well, we had sex before, but remember the tea video? Just because you had sex one time with this person, that does not mean that consent is everlasting. Okay? Um, someone who's drunk or high, you know, well, they were drunk. They must have wanted it. They were, they were high. Um, they said when they were stoned and lying on the floor that they really wanted it. Well, in Texas, what we know, if somebody has reached the point of inebriation, they cannot consent legally. So that would, again, fall under sexual assault. What about what someone's wearing? You shouldn't have been wearing that outfit. Your dress was too low cut. Your shorts were too short. That is not what makes somebody sexually assault somebody. Anybody should be allowed to wear whatever they want and feel comfortable wearing it um, without the fear of being a, a sexually assaulted. We already talked about sex workers and people who were married. So I want to make sure that we talk about false reports. People will say many, many times, well, you know all these people are just making this up. Well, the reality is when we look at children who are sexually assaulted, less than 2% of children are making any of this up. And out of those 2%, they're not making up what happened to them. 
what we tend to know is it sometimes sounds like a kid is coming up with a story and what has happened is that they have been abused multiple times and in their heads it is all mixing into one thing so sometimes it can get hard to pick apart and those are the two percent when we look at adults only about four to seven percent of people ever false report being sexually assaulted and this is the same as other kinds of crimes such as car robbery break-ins other things have the exact same number of people who false report these crimes. So it is not abnormal because sure, some people lie about things, but the majority of people are not, okay? I'm sure you can come up with some other myths. What I want you to know about this is it is so important to identify myths that you believe in. And it is so important to forgive yourself for it because we all have myths. We all believe in these at some point. You know, I, I'm sure I still believe in some because what myths do is they give us a false sense of safety. If I believe, well, I'm not a sex worker or I never dress like that or I never go to that park, therefore I will never be sexually assaulted, then that is going to help me keep work, walking through this world having this false sense of safety and security. But what happens? Well, the reality is, what happens is we turn these myths in, and it become, into victim blaming. And victim blaming is when we tell somebody, well, you shouldn't have been doing this. Well, this is why this happened to you. And nobody, nobody deserves to be sexually assaulted. Nobody can ever do anything to be sexually assaulted. Okay? It is never a victim's fault. Never ever. So whenever you are confronted with one of these myths, it is so important for you to identify it and really check yourself with it so that it doesn't turn into that victim blaming. Like I said, because of these, we do have some low reporting. Now we do know people who are survivors of sexual assault are talking about this. About 45% of the time, survivors tell a friend that they've been sexually assaulted. About 31% of the time, they tell a family member. That's great. They are, people are talking about this. They're trying to get resources. They're reaching out for help. But what if those people believe those myths? What if it's a family member who says, keep this quiet? Or a friend who says, well, you were drinking too much. Are you sure that's really what happened to you? Well, what we know if that's the case is that survivors are less likely to start seeking help. And when people don't start seeking help after a traumatic experience, whether it is the day after, the year after, 10 years later, then they have those ongoing effects of trauma throughout their life. So we have to, again, confront those myths in order to believe people. And when we look at law enforcement, only about 9% of people in Texas report sexual assault to law enforcement. That's really low. It's actually lower than the national average. The national average is about 12%. Only about 6% of people report to, med to seek medical care. And while sometimes we can give law enforcement and medical care maybe a bad rap, saying, you know, doctors are too hard on people or law enforcement's too hard on people, we need to check ourselves. If you look at the pink bubble, that is social workers and helping professionals. Survivors only report to us about 15% of the time. So what is happening? There's still this idea that people in helping professionals, the medical field, law enforcement is not going to believe survivors. So they are not reaching out. Or maybe they are telling that friend and that friend isn't believing them so they're not taking that next step. We need to somehow find a way to have everybody start by believing survivors so that we can increase these numbers. We're going to show a video of some survivors and who are just talking about why they didn't report. As you're listening to them, listen to some of those myths that they believed. And then because they believe them so much, it really instilled even more shame and guilt after the assault. I was 22 when I was raped. I was 19. I was 20. I didn't report it for, you know, a thousand reasons, a million reasons. It was somebody I was involved with. It was a friend of a friend. My drug dealer. Met this photographer by myself. I got very drunk. I met some guy in this bar. He started trying to kiss me and and I said, no. He takes my left leg and raises it on his shoulder. He went to 
put his hand in my panties and I tried to kind of deflect his hand and that's when he slapped my hand away. I blacked out. I was fighting like pretty hard at this point, just saying, no, please don't, please don't. I came to, internally I was shaking. I was really trying to look as calm as possible and I could uh, tell that something that I hadn't wanted to happen happened. He just, he held me down and he, he forced himself inside me. I was being pleasant and nice just so I could remain safe and get out of there. And I kind of just ran out into the street with like my pants on inside out and my shoes off. And he um, sat up and he looked at me and that was, I guess, the scariest moment for me because I could tell he was deciding whether he was actually going to stop or not, and that was the moment that I realized that I had thought I was in control of a situation that I was not in control of at all. And I blame myself for putting myself in that situation. I knew that I had no proof. I could hear people's judgment saying, well, why did you do that? It was your fault. I was still in like physical pain from this and sitting there going, oh, well, no one's gonna believe me. It was my word against his. Everyone was just gonna go, this girl just, you know, slept with this guy and changed her mind. I wasn't the perfect victim. I figured who's gonna believe some cokehead college girl. I didn't like try to fight him off or I didn't slap him around or, you know, I didn't pick up the phone and call 911. I didn't know that I was important enough to, um, to draw boundaries around what people could and couldn't do with my body. Who wants to come forward with the literal most violating thing that can happen to you, relive it, and then have people telling you that you're making it up? I thought I would just be better off trying to put this behind me. I couldn't imagine pressing charges and then having to sit in a courtroom and look at his face over and over. I thought, well, you know, that's like giving him what he wants, like I'm spending more time on him or spending more energy on this. I imagine, and I think rightfully so, that it would have been more traumatizing for me in many ways had I reported it. It's up to a survivor to decide what they do with their story. It's up to them if they want to report it or not. I don't want this to be a part of who I am. I hated myself a lot at the time. We are violated, we are harassed, we are touched, we are trapped, we're scared. And we just take a chip on the shoulder and we keep our lives going and that's not fair to us. And I think it would be wrong to tell them that they don't get to decide what happens next. Okay, so in that we heard a lot about, again, those myths. You know, we heard people talking about that once where I was saying, um, you know, she was using drugs, it was her drug dealer. Another person saying she was like the wrong place at the wrong time or people had warned peop these women about uh, the people who, were, who offended them. Um, and, they, and they took that guilt and it became shame. It became something that uh, really kept them from moving forward. It kept them from getting help right away. And there is a difference. I want to make sure that we touch on this. There is a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is, I did something bad. Okay. Shame is, I am bad. There is something inside me that caused this to happen. There is something that just made this offender know they could take advantage of me. There's something bad about me. Okay. What survivors feel is shame. And a lot of that comes from our myths and beliefs in our culture that are just ongoing and ongoing. And at some point we have to stop this. We have to put a cog in this wheel that starts to redirect it so that we are believing people. They're not even believing themselves that this is what really happened. Okay. So if somebody came to you and they told you they were just recently sexually assaulted, how would you handle it? What would you do next? Well, there is a chance for someone to receive a forensic exam, okay? So we're going to talk about what are these steps for a forensic exam. If somebody is sexually assaulted in Tarrant County, they have 120 hours to receive a sexual assault forensic exam. If it's Texas in general or certain private hospitals in Tarrant County, they have 96 hours. So the law in Texas is 96 hours, but at JPS in Tarrant County in Fort Worth, 
um, they have been able to collect DNA evidence from survivors within 120 hours. So people have 96 to 120 hours to go to the hospital and request a sexual assault forensic exam. Now, I know it says do not drink, eat, or brush your teeth, and that's really hard for survivors to believe in. It also, you know, we also encourage people not to take a shower. Well, what are you gonna do? You know, people, what they want is to take a shower, to feel clean, to get the person off of them. But what's happening is, remember, this is a crime, and your body was the crime scene, okay? So what's happening is every time you take a shower, that's DNA going off your body into the drain. Every time you drink, that is DNA going down your throat and unable to be obtained. Same with brushing your teeth, you're spitting it out. They said it in the video, but this is one of the most invasive and I believe most personal crimes a person could ever experience. Because your body is the crime scene. And the forensic exam is not to make sure that you're physically okay. You will receive one of those first, or, or victims will receive one of those first, but the forensic exam is to collect evidence off of your body, okay? It is to collect specimens. It's to deal with if there are medical concerns, okay? And it's really to make sure that that evidence is collected and put into a kit and stored so that um, people can report this now or report it later so that it can be prosecuted, hopefully. Now, there are two things at the very end that says report versus non-report. People can report to the hospital and say they want to cooperate with law enforcement. If that's the case, if someone walks in and says, I'm here for a sexual assault or exam, or what we hear a lot of times is, I'm here for a rape kit, and I want to talk to law enforcement, that's fine. They'll talk to law enforcement. Law enforcement will collect the evidence after the, after, will take the kit after the evidence has been collected from a specialized nurse examiner and then the investigation will proceed. But there's also something in Texas called a non-report. So someone can walk into a hospital and say, I've been sexually assaulted, I want a rape kit or a sexual assault forensic exam, but I don't want to talk to the police right now. That's okay. People can still receive the forensic exam, still receive treatment from the specialized sexual assault nurse examiner, get all the evidence collected, and it will be stored down at the DB DPS storage facility in Houston for up to two years. This is in hopes that people will go receive trauma-informed counseling within that two-year period and feel more comfortable, confident, and empowered to eventually cooperate with law enforcement. Okay, So you can report and talk to law enforcement right away, but you don't have to. Again, if somebody comes to you and tells you they've been sexually assaulted, it's so important to look at this and just give them this option. Not all people report for forensic exams. Remember that stat I showed you, only about 6% report for medical exams in Texas. And that is okay. It is always a victim's choice. It is always a victim's decision. If we offer them their choices, they can make it on their own. And since this is a crime about power and control, we have to remember that someone's power was taken away, their choices were taken away. And by offering them this choice saying, you can go receive this forensic exam if you want, but you don't have to, we're starting to give their choices back. Okay, so now we're gonna watch another video that really looks into why you should believe people. I always was told, if someone touches you, you tell, you tell, you tell. They did a rape kit on me. I thought they're just gonna go out in the week and catch them. And right now, my name is on a box, on a shelf that has never been tested. Really stunning news today about the number of rape cases police have never even tried to solve. I had no clue people stockpiled rape kits. Rape kits. Untested. Never opened, never tested. I was shocked there was just racks in an abandoned warehouse with windows open and birds flying around. I could understand one city being negligent, but a nation? When you find out that you have thousands of kits, what do you do? We had to bring justice to these victims. The rape kit backlog is the most shocking demonstration of how we regard these crimes. There were rapists who were not caught. And I can't understand what was so unimportant about me. What were you wearing that particular morning? What they see doesn't look like a real victim. Violence against women is a low priority. All of these kits should be tested. 
There are rape kits that haven't been processed across this nation. And those kits start getting results. Every day we get another 20 to 30 hits. Over 700 identified serial rapists just in one city, in one county, in one state. Of course we made mistakes. We didn't realize the potential. You can't change or fix what happened to one person. What you can change is what might happen to someone else. When you get that list of names and it just scrolls down and it doesn't stop, this is something where we can't rest. You don't tell me what I can and can't do. And all right. it takes is focus, dedication, and commitment. The system should be more accountable. I am evidence that this is not just a kit. This is a person. So that was the trailer for I Am Evidence. You can stream it on HBO, the full version of the movie, or you can contact the Women's Center. We also own the full version of the movie. Um, but the whole point of just showing you some of that is we have to believe people. So what, what was happening with the rape kit backlog uh, that really started to blow up out of Detroit is that um, thousands of sexual assault forensic exam kits were found. They had not been tested. They had just been stored in a dirty, rundown storage facility. And in a lot of them, the statute of limitations ran out. Well, in Detroit, in Los Angeles, and in a few other cities, they started testing some of these kits that were in this, and they started finding the serial rapists. So go back to what we said earlier about how the majority of the time, People who sexually offend on others do it over and over again. It's not everybody in the world sexually assaulting other people. It's a small group of people doing it over and over and over again. And by testing these kits, you know, just in Detroit alone at the time the video came out, they had found over 700 serial rapists, meaning more than three times, sexually assaulting someone three times or more. Okay. Um, so again, it's so important to believe people because we have to be able to show them that we want the evidence collected, that, that you are important, that what happened to you is a crime. And the first step to doing that is telling them, I believe you, and then offering them the resources, such as helping them find a way to receive a forensic exam. Okay. Now, we've been talking this whole time about effects of survivors. There we go. Thank you. We've been talking this whole time on effects of survivors, so let's go ahead and break it down a little bit more. I hate lists, but everybody loves them. So we're going to look at what are some short-term effects and what are some long-term effects. <sighs> Please know that the short-term ones can easily be on the long-term effects. Please know that this list is not extensive, that there are so many different effects of sexual violence, but this is what we tend to see that are pretty common across the board. If we look at the short term, we already talked about people blaming themselves. But again, it's not just blame, it's not just guilt, it's a feeling of shame. And that can easily cross into the long term effects if people do not start getting help for this, okay? That initial feeling of feeling dirty, you know, that need to take a shower, the feeling, the need to brush your teeth, to get that person off of you, okay? And again, the guilt. Um, the guilt would really maybe more sound like, oh, I shouldn't have been running in that park. Um, oh, I shouldn't have gone out with that guy, or I shouldn't have gone out with that girl. That might be some of the guilt, but that really does turn into that deep-rooted shame. Um, people will start feeling disconnected from others, and that can easily become something in the long term having difficulty with boundaries. What this can look like is somebody who used to have pretty healthy boundaries, all of a sudden has none. You know, that's that friend of yours that is like, hey, all the time, like hugging up on you and like not respecting that your personal space is this big. You know, they just want to like lean on you. I always joke that that's my sister and I'm the one that has the big personal space bubble. Okay. Or it could be someone who had some pretty healthy boundaries who all of a sudden has these very rigid boundaries. They don't want someone getting close to them physically. They don't want somebody talking to them. They don't have any real close friends anymore. They're not going to have anybody to invite to birthday parties or to hang out with because they no longer trust people. Okay? If you think about, again, sexual assault is a crime about power and control. Somebody has taken control of my boundaries. What I thought were healthy are no longer healthy. They were violated. So people will start to think, well, then I don't know what to do. So let me make them more rigid or let me just let them all go. Okay. Um, well, it says problems toileting on the short terms. That's more for children. What we'll see a lot of times with kids is that they'll regress back to younger ages. Uh, someone who has so a child who is potty trained will regress back to not being potty trained. Um, or because 
uh, they are having nightmares, you might see some children wetting the bed. Okay. Um, some other long-term effects. Um, it says domestic violence is a long-term effect. What that actually means is that somebody who has been sexually assaulted or experienced a violent crime is at a higher risk of experiencing violent crimes later in their life if they don't overcome the trauma. That's because, again, you're staying in that high stress part of your brain. Maybe you have already had some issues with boundaries and that person no longer knows how to set appropriate boundaries because, again, they've been violated. And so it makes someone more vulnerable to other violence in the future. Okay. Some other ones I just want to touch on would be eating disorders. So we see this a lot. You hear a lot about bulimia or restrictive eating, such as anorexia. That's because, again, power and control. I didn't have power and control over what someone did to my body, but I can have power and control over what I put in my body from now on. Okay? I will control every piece of that. You'll also see this combined with the boundaries with people who overeat. Somebody who is now like trying to gain weight on purpose or maybe it's subconscious in order to put up a physical boundary, a larger physical boundary okay, to regain that control and power over their body. Um, people who are sexually assaulted ha are 13 more times likely to abuse alcohol, 26 times likely to abuse drugs. They're also about four times more likely to self-harm and have suicidal ideation, um, and three times more likely to experience depression and anxiety. Now this is long-term if there is no treatment for it. And because these are ways that people are trying to cope with the trauma. Okay? When we look at trauma, we have to know trauma doesn't just go away. Trauma stays with us until we start receiving help for it. Okay. When somebody is sexually assaulted, let me put down my clicker and do my, my high-functioning high brain here. If this is my brain and this is half of my brain, what, we, what happens in trauma is this top part of our brain, our neocortex, kind of goes offline. And instead, we start working through our um, reptilian portion of our brain, where our amygdala is stored, where our hippocampus is stored. This is the part of our brain that was first created when we were first created. And then, and it is the one that we go to every time we experience a traumatic experience, okay? This is the part of the brain that keeps us safe. This is the part of the brain that keeps us breathing. It controls the autonomic nervous system, which I also call the automatic nervous system, because this system just tells us to breathe. And so we're not always thinking, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. This is the part of our neuro system that tells us um, blink your eyes so your eyes stay wet. All of these things that are automatic with us. Okay? When you're sexually assaulted, your neocortex goes offline and you are now dealing with your reptilian brain. Because of this, memories are stored in the senses. So your olfactory gland or your smell gland. They are stored in your touch. They are stored in your sight your sight sense. They're not stored chronologically in this neocortex. Okay. And because of that, people experience triggers. So they smell something and they have a flashback to what happened to them. Now, a flashback is not just a memory. A flashback is actually feeling like you were in the place. You are feeling unsafe. You start hyperventilating. People will have panic attacks because they start believing they are there. Okay. That is a trigger and that is a flashback. Okay. Again, it's that feeling of that loss of power and control all over again. Okay. And this can happen throughout someone's life, but one of the things that we do to help people is in trauma counseling really to identify some of their triggers so at least people can be, start being prepared for them. Okay. So how can you help survivors? Well, we've talked a lot about believing people, and that really is the number one thing. Again, it says responding to a disclosure of child sexual abuse as the Baser model, but this can be for adults as well. In fact, we really encourage it for adults as well. And let's go over it a little. Believe, believe, believe. People are not making this up. Okay? People, there's no reason somebody would tell somebody this happened to them when they are facing not being believed and somebody blaming them. Then go to the hospital to receive one of the most invasive exams you can ever receive and then report and try to cooperate with law enforcement when only 6% of people are going to go to jail for this. Okay, so believe people. Okay, let them tell their story. 
What we know about believing people is not only were they more likely to start receiving help and reaching out for services, but actually, going back to my brain, the neural pathways when you experience trauma, like I said earlier in the session, shift because you have to start finding some other pathways to stay safe. But when you are believed, they will start going back to normal. So instead of being all wonky, they will actually go back to the pathways they were made to be just by believing somebody. That is amazing. Just the power of your words, just by telling somebody, I believe you. I believe this happened to you. I believe what you're telling me. Okay. We want to affirm people. We want to let them know that you did the right thing by telling me. We can get you some resources. We can get you some support. You don't have to go through this alone. Okay. You want to support people. And by supporting, I don't mean be their counselor. I don't mean, you know, drag them around everywhere. I mean letting them know this was not your fault. It is never someone's fault if they are sexually assaulted. Okay? This was not your fault. There's nothing that you could have done that was asking for it. There's nothing that you could have done that caused this to happen. This is not your fault. And then we want to empower people. We want to empower them because we want them to go seek help. Okay? We want people to say to know there are resources. I can help you find resources. Again, you're not their therapist. You are not going to be their resource. But maybe you can go with them to find resources. Maybe you can be the last one that says refer. You can be the one who can say, you know, I know these people at the Women's Center. They're pretty great. And um, they have trauma-informed counseling for free. Let's go there together. Okay? It's so important. This is not on the Baser model, but it's important for sur secondary survivors as well. So what I mean by that is we have a primary survivor who is the person who this victimization happened to, but you also have secondary survivors who are the support system, the parents, the best friends, um, the grandparents, the children, people who are supporting primary survivors through all of this healing process. What we know about trauma is trauma spreads. It doesn't just stay with the primary survivor. Even in the DSM-5, what we hear and what we know about trauma and PTSD is one of the qualifiers is if you are listening to somebody talk about sexual violence and sexual assault over and over again. If you're a first responder, you can experience PTSD. Okay? Trauma spreads. If you are listening and supporting somebody, you are their primary support system, it's so important for you also to get support, to feel empowered and to refer or find referrals for yourself for counseling. And we do that also, another plug for the Women's Center, we work with secondary survivors as well. As people are going through their healing process, we want to continue to help them. Okay, so the baser is the initial, let's get you somewhere for some help. But the healing process is not just this one day, I'm healed, or even a month later. You know, people deal with this for years. This changes your brain chemistry. This changes how, what happens on, to your body. Like I said at the beginning, this has medical effects later on in life if the trauma is not healed. And remember, 63 to 65% of people in Texas have multiple victimizations. That means that they're not, again, just dealing with this one trauma. They're being triggered again by all these other traumas in the past. Okay? So this is not just a one-time, let's heal from this and move forward. This is an ongoing thing. So you really want to reassure people through this. You're doing the right thing. You are safe. You are safe now. Let's get you to a safe place. Continue to educate yourself and offer some resources. You know, one of the things that we do is we have a class called Intro to Trauma that is a four-week session. It's an open group, so anybody can attend it starting at any point, and it is just education about the effects of trauma. That's so important for victims to know about because it helps to start taking away some of that shame. It starts to take away some of that shame that people feel about well, if I could just get over this, I'd be a better parent. If I could just get over this, I'd be a better partner, or I'd have better relationships, okay? When people start learning about the actual effects of trauma and actual effects of why things happen, it really starts to empower people. We want to give people choices. Again, 
power and control has been taken away. By giving people choices, they can start regaining that power. And I don't mean choices like, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? I literally mean small choices. When we respond to hospitals as the ho um, hospital, com to hospital, ho I'm sorry y'all, to accompany people at the hospital for recent sexual assaults, we start with little things like, my name is Catherine, may I sit in this chair or do you want me to stay standing? After the exam, would you like water or would you like this Coke? Okay, small choices. If you give people something large, they will become overwhelmed. We wanna start small and let them build on it. Let them be empowered by making the choices for themselves. Be objective. Don't put your own biases into this. Know the myths that you believe and don't victim blame, okay? Watch your voice and body language. It's really easy to say, I believe you, but sound condescending, have be crossed off on this because this can be uncomfortable for a lot of us to talk and hear about. I'm one of those weirdos that likes to talk and hear about it. So watch your voice, watch your language, be gentle, be kind, be open. Make eye contact with people. If you're looking away when you're telling somebody I believe you, they know you're not listening. Make that eye contact. That helps people start to, again, decrease that shame. If you're looking away, if I say I believe you, what I am telling you is, oh man, this is such a shameful subject. I can't even listen to this. That is just adding on. So make eye contact with people. Again, make resources for yourself. Give resources to survivors. There are resources on campus. There's all kinds in Tarrant County, and it, there's a lot everywhere. But if you don't know where to go, reach out. Somebody will be able to help find trauma-informed resources. And then last one, take care of yourself. We've already talked about why that is important, but it is so important. I just have to stress it. Practice self-care. Help survivors practice self-care. Take care of yourself. The last thing is you are going to see a lot of people move through these stages of adjustment throughout their healing process, okay? Initially, people will be shocked, okay? These look kind of like the stages of grief, right? Someone will be shocked, someone will be in denial, there's anger, but, but they don't go in order. It could go all the way to the bottom, oh, it's just something that happened to me. So it sounds like assimilation or acceptance, but then all of a sudden they're still having triggers. That's normal. And, and actually, any of these responses, I know it says, I'm numb, this could never have happened, what did I do, why me? These are just examples. As humans, we respond to things in very different ways. I am one of those people who laugh when I am uncomfortable. So if I were in shock, there have been times, in very inappropriate times in my life, where I start laughing because I am in shock. That's how I handle things sometimes. That happens with survivors too. A friend might be sitting in front of you and say, I was sexually assaulted last night, and start laughing. That does not mean they're lying. That means that they are trying to cope with what happened. So as people move through this, just know it can look at any other way. It can look any way. And again, just continue to help by supporting, believing, and providing those resources. That is all that we have today. My information is here on this slide. Please take it if you want it. Um, definitely make sure to take the Women's Center information. Uh, the, I just realized that our website is not on this slide. It was at the very beginning, but that is womenscentertc, as in tarrantcounty.org, and you can find out more information about resources in our area. Some other resources just to point out would be the Texas Association Against Sexual Assault, or TASA. You can go to their website at taasa.org. They are the State Coalition of Sexual Assault, and they can provide resources from all around the state, as well as some links to national resources. Hope you learned a lot today and can take something from it for your future work as a social worker. Thank you.